Okay, so welcome to this second video on calcium waves. Okay, so we are discussing how we can trigger um, calcium waves in hepatocytes. So, basically, the way we're going to do it is using this drug, phenylephrine, which is uh, a selective alpha-1 agonist, basically. So, it's going to bind to the alpha-1 receptor, and it's going to activate it. Now, alpha-1 receptors are G-protein-coupled receptors, so they have seven transmembrane alpha helices, and they are coupled to a heterotrimeric G-protein. So, let's draw that here. So, this receptor is coupled to a heterotrimeric G protein. Now, heterotrimeric G proteins consist of three subunits, an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit. Now, you can make a huge number of heterotrimeric G proteins because there are 16 different genes which code for alpha subunits, there are five different genes which code for beta subunits, and there are 12 different genes which code for gamma subunits. So you can make a huge number of different uh, heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, um, the alpha-1 um, receptor is specifically coupled to GQ G proteins. So this G protein needs to be of the GQ type, basically. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, basically, the G protein uh, is named after which alpha subunit it has, i.e. we don't care what the beta and the gamma subunit are. So if you have a GQ, heterotrimeric G protein, what that means is that this alpha subunit is the alpha Q subunit. Okay, so the alpha-1 receptor is coupled to the GQG protein, which means that the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein it's coupled to is alpha Q. Right, now, um, when the heterotrimeric G protein is inactive, the uh, alpha subunit is bound to GDP, like so, okay? And when both the receptor and the G protein are inactive, in some circumstances, the uh, G protein coupled receptor can actually be physically bound to the inactive G protein, i.e. they're physically coupled. At other times, the heterotrimeric G protein will be bound to the intracellular aspect or the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there, basically. So it'll be skating around over here somewhere underneath the, on the inner aspect of the uh, membrane. So it'll be very close by this receptor. Now, when the agonist, phenylephrine, binds to the alpha-1 receptor, the alpha-1 receptor becomes catalytically active. And what it's going to do is it's going to cleave off this GDP from the alpha Q subunit, and it's going to take a GTP molecule from the cytoplasm, so let's say we've got GTP over here, and it's basically going to bind that GTP to the alpha Q subunit. Okay, so you're now going to end up with alpha Q bound to uh, GTP, basically. And once you've got the alpha Q subunit bound to GTP, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit. So the beta and the gamma subunit remain together, and they're now called the beta gamma subunit. Uh, but uh, the alpha Q with its GTP goes off on its own little adventure. Right, and what it goes and does is it goes and activates uh, an enzyme in the membrane of the cell, which is phospholipase C, specifically phospholipase C beta, basically. Okay, and uh, this enzyme phospholipase C beta basically takes a um, constituent of the phospholipid bilayer and breaks it down. So what's the enzyme phospholipase C beta going to do? Well, let's draw it down here. If this is phospholipase C beta, what it's going to do is it's going to take a component of the membrane, which is PIP2, which I'll draw like so. Uh, two of its hydrophobic tails there. Then it's got uh, a phosphate group there, the inositol group here, and the two phosphate groups coming off of here and here. Okay, so this is PIP2, and it sits in the phospholipid bilayer. So this is PIP2. Right, and basically, what phospholipase C beta is going to do is it's going to cut this bond here between the uh, diacylglyceride here and the uh, phosphate group here, basically. So, what it's going to split this into is a diacylglyceride molecule over here. So this is diacylglyceride, and I'll write all these names out in full in a moment. 
and it's going to split it also into this inositol 145 trisphosphate or IP3 molecule over here, like so. Right, okay, so this is IP3, and now I need to write these names out for you. IP3. Okay, so this is phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate. Phosphatidyl inositol. Oh dear, we're going over our picture of um, adrenaline. 45 bisphosphate. Okay, right. Uh, that's what PIP2 stands for. Uh, IP3 stands for inositol. 145 trisphosphate inositol 145 trisphosphate and DAG uh, stands for diacylglyceride okay so this stands for diacylglyceride okay right so there are all those fan big fancy names written out and basically, what now happens is that the IP3 that you produce in this uh, reaction is going to um, activate IP3 receptors, or it's going to prime IP3 receptors. Okay, so I think we'll go on to the next page to do this. Now, if we draw our hepatocyte back again, and we'll draw a nice big hepatocyte here. So here's our hepatocyte. We need to remember that this hepatocyte didn't just have one alpha-1 receptor on it. It was covered in alpha-1 receptors, basically. So, when we doused this hepatocyte in phenylephrine, what would have happened is all over the place, you will have had these alpha-1 receptors being activated, basically. So, over here, over here, and all over the place, basically, you had these alpha-1 receptors being activated, which means that you've been making IP3 all over the place. So IP3 is going up over here, IP3 is going up over here, and IP3 is going up over here, all over the place, basically. So you are, oh dear, what have I doing done there? So you're going to get IP3 going up cytoplasmically. Now, basically, there is an organelle which sort of spans the entire cell known as the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. So this is going to be our endoplasmic reticulum here. Okay, right. Endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. It sequesters calcium from the cytoplasm and puts it in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So there's quite a high calcium concentration in here. Whereas the calcium concentration in the uh, cytoplasm is very, very low, approximately 100 nanomolar, basically. Right. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum has in its membrane channels, basically, receptors for IP3. So I'll draw these here. So these are IP3 receptors here, which are calcium channels. They allow calcium to move through when they are open. But at the moment, they are closed. Uh, so there's no calcium coming out of the endoplasmic reticulum at the moment. And calcium level in the cytoplasm is very, very low. Now, we need to discuss what, how IP3 interacts uh, with its receptor, basically. So, let me draw a bigger picture of these IP3 receptors here. Okay, so here is a bigger picture of our IP3 receptor. Right. Like so. Okay, so, um, basically, all of these IP3 receptor, uh, receptors are made up of four proteins, four polypeptides. Um, so it's not one huge great polypeptide, it's made up of four distinct polypeptides or four distinct subunits. Now, there are three genes coding for subunits of IP3 receptors, i.e. coding for the proteins which can make up a quarter of the IP3 receptor. And basically, um, you don't actually have to make homotetramers. A homotetramer would be if you took one of these genes, made four proteins from that gene, and stuck them all together to make an IP3 receptor that had an identical uh, subunit making it up. 
Now, a heterotetramer is where you use different um, subunits, basically. Different genes code for different subunits. Uh, but, and you, in the case of IP3 receptors, you can make heterotetramers. They do exist in, uh, in real life. Okay, so um, that's just a bit uh, of a side information. And uh, I'll just mention also, as a little aside, that these subunits that make up the IP3 receptor are massive. They're usually around 2,750 amino acids in length. They are massive great proteins. Okay, so now let's discuss the actual um, opening of these channels. So basically, IP3 does not, repeat does not, cause these receptors to open. It's a big um, misunderstanding. Well, it's not. A, you'd be forgiven for saying that, they were, uh, co that IP3 causes them to open, but it's incorrect. IP3 um, basically primes these receptors for opening. So before we can discuss what, uh, what it actually does, we need to discuss what... Uh, what the state of the IP3 receptor is before IP3 has bound. So basically, before IP3 has bound, each one of these IP3 subunits has on its extracellular domain, and I've made a mistake here somewhere, um, oh dear, that should have been there, never mind, um, has on its extracellular domain uh, an a inhibitory calcium binding site. So before IP3 is bound, this is the state of the IP3 receptor. You have, on every single one of the subunits, uh, a binding site for calcium, and this is an inhibitory calcium binding site. So if calcium binds to that binding site, that inhibitory uh, binding site, uh, then basically it will uh, inactivate the receptor, it will inhibit it, it will make it more likely to be in the closed state. Okay? Now, each one of the four subunits also has a binding site for IP3. So let's have this here. So let's have the one closest to the pore being this binding site for IP3. Okay, so IP3 can bind in this pink binding site here. So each IP3 receptor has a binding site for IP3. So this is the binding site for IP3. Okay, right. When IP3 binds to its binding site, what it does is it changes the conformation of the protein. So it changes the conformation of the IP3 receptor subunit, one of these quarters of the whole receptor. And basically, it removes the inhibitory binding site and makes available a new calcium binding site, which is a activatory or stimulatory calcium binding site. So basically, the receptor changes now. So let's draw another... Uh, receptor here, which is the one where you actually have IP3 bound, basically. So here is the IP3 receptor, the four different subunits, um, the IP3 binding site, which now has IP3 bound to it, and basically you get a new binding site which it, for calcium, which is an activatory calcium binding site. So I'll draw this in green. Okay, and if calcium binds to this stimulatory calcium binding site, it will now cause the channel to open. So um, the IP3 receptor is not opened uh, by um, IP3 binding. Instead, it is put into a confirmation where it can be stimulated to open by calcium binding to the stimulatory calcium binding site here. Okay, and. Uh, those other binding sites that I've shown here are still these IP3 binding sites, so I'll draw them in the same colour. Okay, but with IP3 now bound, so this is in the IP3 bound state. Okay, so now what's going to happen in our hepatocyte is that IP3 has gone up cytoplasmically. It's gone up everywhere. So, to all of these IP3 receptors, what is going to happen is that IP3 is going to bind to all of them. So, all of the IP3 receptors have now got IP3 bound, basically. Okay, so, they are all primed and ready to go, is the reality. They're all primed and ready to go. So, all that they're waiting for now is some calcium to trigger the whole thing off. So, basically... 
some calcium needs to come somewhere. This is the hole in my explanation. I don't know where the calcium comes from. It comes from the extracellular compartment, but I don't know if we know what actually allows that calcium in. But some calcium comes from somewhere. So let's say there is a little bit of calcium coming in from uh, this portion over here, basically. What will now happen is that that calcium will come and bind to the stimulatory calcium binding sites on this primed IP3 receptor. Okay. Uh, now, what that will cause is it will cause this IP3 receptor to now be opened. So it will open and calcium will come out of the endoplasmic reticular lumen into the cytoplasm. So out comes calcium. So calcium is going to go up in that region of the cell, basically. So, if we were to um, plot a graph of this, then if we label this position one of the cell, we'll label this position two and this position three over here, then what's happening at this moment is that calcium is now going up, basically. Okay, now, what that is going to cause is this calcium is going to spill over, basically, onto region 2, if you like. So I might put some little artificial divisions in the cell. So this is region 1 over here. This is region 2 here. And this is region 3 over here. Right. So calcium is going to spill over from region 1 onto region 2. Now, the IP3 receptors in region 2 are all primed and ready to go. So when calcium comes over here, it will bind to the stimulatory calcium binding sites that are on this IP3 receptor because it's got IP3 bound to it, and those will now open. So you're going to get calcium released from uh, these IP3 receptors in region 2. So if we now plot what's happening for region 2, so this was the graph for region 1, basically now region 2, with a bit of a delay, region 2 is going to go up, okay? Now, um, again, this is going to propagate from region 2 to region 1, 3, because if calcium has been released from uh, the in intracellular stores in region 2, it's going to spill over and it's going to go into region 3, and again, these IP3 receptors are primed and ready to go because IP3 is bound to them, so the stimulatory calcium binding sites are exposed, so all that needs to happen is that calcium needs to bind to its stimulatory calcium binding sites, and that will cause them to open. So those will release calcium from their intracellular store. So if we now plot the graph for um, region 3, again, it will be delayed of the graph for region 2, but again, calcium is going to go up. So you get this wave of calcium. Now, the important thing to understand is that, again, this one does not, if I uh, we need to know what is going to happen now to each of these graphs. What's going to happen to region 1? Is it just going to remain really high up? Is this what's going to happen? I'll draw it in blue because it's incorrect. Um, so is that what's going to happen? It's going to just stay high? No, is the answer. It comes back down afterwards. So region 1 goes back down, region 2 goes back down, region 3 goes back down. So all of them, what happens is calcium goes up for a moment, bang, that causes calcium to be released from the uh, next region, so the wave propagates forward, but then it falls back down. Why does it fall back down? Well, basically, we don't know. Uh, we don't understand the mechanisms. What we do know is that the IP3 receptor closes. So, um, something causes the IP3 receptors to close. What we suspect it is, is that the calcium, well, actually, what we do know is that calcium inhibits the IP3 receptor. So, this seems kind of contradictory because I told you calcium activates the IP3 receptor. So, what am I telling you now? Am I spouting garbage? Uh, no. Low levels of calcium does stimulate the IP3 receptor. It binds to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, and that causes the IP3 receptor to open. But if calcium level gets very, very high, what's going to happen is that you get this negative feedback. Then, if you've got very, very high calcium, then it starts inhibiting the IP3 receptors. So we'll continue this discussion in the next video.